morning, everyone, and welcome. We're delighted to have you joining us here today for an incredible conversation on the entire overview of the M&A landscape. Before we get started, I have a few things that I would like to share with you. First and foremost, my name is Nicola Corzine, and I'm the founding executive director of the NASDAQ Center. If you are joining us for the first time today, we're so thrilled to have you with us. And if you don't know, the NASDAQ Center is an independent nonprofit with a mission to really accelerate access and equity in the field of entrepreneurship and really help entrepreneurs from all over the globe realize their maximum potential and grow. Now, as you may have seen in today's chat and in our opening video, we've recently launched a massive movement around mentorship. One common ingredient we know that matters to all entrepreneurs, no matter their stage, no matter what they're heading into, is access to expert networks, a little bit like we're tapping into today in, in the session that we have. And so we recently launched with our partner, Mentor Cloud, a massive access open network of expert network to help you identify the needs that you have in your business and really tap into that expertise wherever you may be. So if you're looking to get connected with mentors that can help you grow and accelerate your business, if you have any business challenges that you're trying to overcome, we'd invite you to sign up and gain access to that network. It's an incredible offering that has been development. Um, over the next year, we really aim to unlock a million mentor hours for more than 50,000 businesses and we don't want you to miss out on that opportunity. On the other hand, if you're joining us today with some expertise that you'd like to provide and give to our entrepreneurs, please know that any and all time is welcomed in this offering. So please take a moment to also sign up and join us in that cause. Entrepreneurs really are our dreamers, they are our doers, they are our visionaries. They're not just solving the problems that we need today, but they're also looking ahead to change our future for the better. And now more than ever, we need them there. So please join us in considering giving back to that community of entrepreneurs who do so much for us each and every day. Now we are gonna be opening up for live Q&A at the end of each of our panels that we're doing today. So please make sure that you submit your questions at any stage throughout today into the Q&A that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. None of what we do here would be possible without the incredible generosity and support of our amazing sponsors and supporters of the center. So to NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, BPM, and NZTE, thank you so much for all you do for us and for making this great content available for entrepreneurs around the world. I'm gonna launch a couple of polls really quickly before we get started with the market update. And this is uh, something that we do at the beginning of every single session. The first poll that we launch is really to get a quick pulse check of how our entrepreneurial community is doing. Ever since we've been virtual for over a year plus now, we really wanted to first take a moment to pause and say, how are you? How is your wellness? What more can we be doing in support of you? So I'm gonna launch this very first poll and it just asks you from a quick gut check, how are you doing today? Uh, what is going on for you? I really want to get a quick pulse check as to how our entrepreneurs are faring in these incredibly unique times that we've all been through in the last year plus. So I'm going to give everyone a chance to just complete that. Um, not surprisingly, given the topic at hand, and also I think the state of the state, we're seeing a nice healthy dose of optimism, but still many of you who understandably are working through surviving some anxiety out there and, and, and still understandably a little fearful. Wherever you are, we appreciate you sharing this information. I'm going to go ahead and share those results really quickly. Now, um, the next poll that I'm going to launch is uh, helping us create the programs that matter the most to our entrepreneurial community. We don't actually build anything with a sort of a one size fits all approach at the center. We constantly pulse our community to say, what's keeping you up at night? What do you need help with? What are your biggest struggles right now? And then our amazing program team here, go ahead and create those programs, bring in the experts that can really help you get unstuck from those business challenges. So how you respond to this question is actually going to drive forward programming at the center over the next eight to 10 weeks. So we'd encourage you share honestly and earnestly what are those big challenges that you're facing right now and how can we help you get unstuck from those issues. And you'll see those responses in just a second. But most importantly, what we hope you'll be inspired by is seeing the programs that we put forward over the course of the next few months that really aim to help you get unstuck from those issues. Now, the last poll that I'm going to be sharing is um, one that basically just asks for your quick honest feedback on what is the most important side uh, of the house that you're trying to learn through today. So what side of M&A are you looking to learn from today? Is it going to be the sell side? Is it going to be the buy side? Our panel is going to try to be nimble and make sure uh, that we are 
answering as best we can and providing you with as much insights as you would like to have on both of those equations. But uh, if we if we see a higher uh, sensitivity to one side, then we'll certainly adjust some of the questions and some of the uh, areas that we expand into today. Um, we got a lot on both, not surprisingly. Uh, and I guess on the independent side, I'm seeing a little bit more higher on the sell side than on the buy side for this panel, which makes a lot of sense. So I'll end that poll, I'll share those results. Um, one last quick housekeeping item uh, before we get started, and that is just a really quick overview of the agenda today, for if, if this is your first time joining our half-day M&A session. We're going to be kicking off the program with a market update and overview, and then we're going to do a very quick 10-minute break before we transition into our second session, where our panel is going to be really sharing the operational strategy for A to B for early to mid-stage founders. Then we're going to do another quick 10-minute break, and to round us out, we're going to come back with our last session really focusing on growth through acquisitions. That's going to be the buy side overview and the insights. Now, please note that the same Zoom link that you entered today will be this true for all of the sessions that we're offering today. So when in doubt, just go straight back into the Zoom link that you're on right now. And so without any further delay, it is my absolute pleasure in giving a very, very warm welcome to our first presenter to share the m and Market Update. Uh, joining us today is Mahir. He is the Managing Director and Co-Head of TMT KMG, KPMG Corporate Finance, obviously at KPMG. Mahir, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing the update. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, for uh, having us. Uh, and again, thanks to NASDAQ for organizing, organizing this wonderful event. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, let's see, let me, can you guys see my screen? Not yet, Mahir. Hang on. Uh, there we go. It's coming okay. up live now. Great. Right. So. I'll, I'll go through some of the trends of, on kind of what we are seeing in the tech M&A market, just, uh, just to kind of look at kind of what we have seen. We've come, this last 12 months has obviously been a very interesting time for all of us. And so just real quick, in terms of the KPMG practice, uh, I co-head our technology practice in investment banking at KPMG. Uh, the quick headline on us is we are the most active advisor globally in the middle market, something which surprises a lot of people is in the last uh, 10 years, we have closed 4,500 plus transactions. That's about 450 transactions plus per year. And uh, we, are, we continue to be super active in the market. Uh, in the last uh, five years, we've closed 2,800 plus deals. These are what we uh, bring to the market is sort of industry depth as well as a global platform. And our clients are generally VC-backed companies, private equity-backed companies, and founder-owned companies. So we, we're going to talk a little bit about the tech M&A market and what we are seeing in terms of trends. So as you look at this slide, sort of COVID has really had a pretty big impact in terms of uh, tech M&A and pushed companies over the edge in terms of innovation. Uh, hang on for one second, I'm just gonna. Uh, and I think you're seeing sort of digital adoption has taken a quantum leap at both the organization as well as industry levels to just, you know, at the last sort of uh, earnings call, Satya Nadella from Microsoft had an interesting quote that you've seen kind of five years of innovation take place in, in one quarter. I think you're seeing a number of businesses have learned to how to operate remotely and that's required a lot of investment in IT. A uh, lot of our, as, as probably most of you are on, on, on this call are operating remotely. I think what, is, what you've seen is companies have figured out how to use technology to collaborate. And also you've also seen businesses change uh, dramatically going forward. I think you're seeing uh, companies using technologies to have meet and greet meetings. I think you're going to see uh, a pretty significant cut in terms of expenses uh, going forward. Sort of. Uh, so I think you're seeing uh, all of those type of trends kind of driving M&A activity. I think which which if we were having this conversation last March or April, I think 
there was a lot of fear in the market as to how bad this is going to get in terms of uh, COVID. But I think the market has rebounded pretty strongly since then. I think we have seen a record M&A activity in the second half of last year and also uh, in Q1 of this year. I think what's driving m in this market is fundamentally, I think people feel like we are at the end of the tunnel in this, in this environment. I think you're seeing stock market is at sort of record highs. Interest rates are still pretty low and likely to be pretty low for the foreseeable future. And so you're seeing a number of public companies who are generating a lot of cash and investor. There's also a fair amount of shareholder activism where investors want to see companies use that capital or, or dividend it back to shareholders. And then a couple more things. You're also seeing uh, a number of companies that have gone public via an IPO or a SPAC. And I think that there's definitely a lot more alternatives for companies. And I think that's certainly driving uh, a very strong sort of M&A market in terms of multiples being paid. And lastly, uh, private equity firms are super active in this market. There's over a trillion dollars of capital on the sidelines with private equity firms. And we're seeing private equity firms being active in all of our processes. So if, as we go to the next page, we are, we are literally witnessing a V-shaped recovery. If you just, uh, all of us kind of read the read the stats on a daily basis, but you just take a step back. It, it, what we have seen in the last, nine months has been quite remarkable. I mean, just in the second half of last year, there was 495 billion of tech M&A activity compared to 226 billion in the second half of 2019. That's a 119% increase in the second half of 2020 uh, over 2019. Just in the first quarter of this year, there was $305 $305 billion of tech m and uh, which compares to $81 billion in Q120. That's a 276% increase uh, in Q121 versus Q1 2020. So it's a pretty big increase in terms of overall activity. If you look at the right side of the page, uh, right, uh, top right of the page, m and activity by private equity firms has hit an all-time high in Q4 at 53 billion, exceeding a sort of five year quarterly average by 50%. That's a pretty big jump. So again, private equity firms have raised a lot of capital and they are deploying capital at a record record pace. I think you're of all the deals done by private equity firms last year, 70% were add-ons to their portfolio companies. So private equity firms are looking at platforms also being very acquisitive in this market in terms of making add-ons to a number of their portfolio companies. And if you look at the bottom of the page, in bottom left of the page, uh, in terms of mega deals, which is the billion dollar plus deals, 83 deals done, 83 mega deals done in the second half of 2020 compared to 48 deals done in the second half of 19. So if you look at a year over year comparison, a pretty big jump from 48 deals to 83 deals. And already in just the first quarter of this year, there have been 85 mega deals, which is north of a billion dollars. So again, the, just the number for in Q1 in terms of mega deals has exceeded the number for the second half of last year, which was a remarkable second half to begin with. Uh, multiples for mega deals have steadily increased from 2018 to 2020 from 4X to 6X. But then in the first half of uh first half of 2020, the multiple was 4.7x and has increased to 8.4x in the second half of 2020. So again, multiples have been pretty strong in this market as well as overall activity. As we go to, I think all of us have been seeing kind of a number of SPACs being filed in the market and also companies that have that have gone public uh, through SPACs. I think there is sort of a tale of two cities in this market. I think number one, you're seeing a not, number of sort of very early stage companies that uh, are in a, in a big market, especially anything in electric vehicles or, uh, or renewables uh, going public. Uh, and, and secondly, you're seeing companies which are much later stage and slower growth kind of going public through, through a SPAC. Uh, SPACs bought more tech companies in 2020 than in the previous four years combined. Uh, 
there are currently over 150 plus tech focused SPACs that have cash that are looking for acquisitions. So again, there's a lot of capital on the sidelines. 45% uh, of the total tech M&A activity in Q1 was from SPACs. So SPACs are, are very active in this market. Having said that, I think also one thing to note, a couple of things to note is we are we are at the tail end of this cycle in terms of SPACs uh, being very active. I think you're seeing uh, uh, in sort of the newer SPACs that are coming to market, the pricing has shifted in terms, in terms of investors having more pricing power than issuers. You're also seeing signs of a SPAC bubble. I think there's over hundred billion of notional uh, value outstanding. You're seeing increased retail participation, a lot of leverage from prime brokers. Also, you're seeing sponsors bringing multiple deals uh, to, the, to the SPAC market and also lower quality of, of uh, sponsors slash celebrity SPACs. You're seeing Shaq, Era, Jay-Z, Paul Ryan, names like that filing SPACs. When you see names like that who, who are filing SPACs, you're, you're, it's likely to be more the tail end of the market versus uh, uh, the upper end of the market. Uh, having said that, I think it does allow, give give number of companies an opportunity to go public through a SPAC or an IPO. And it really puts pressure on uh, potential buyers because now private companies can access the public markets. Uh, so it's been a very active uh, market in terms of SPACs. Uh, let's talk about some of the key subsectors as we as we go through uh, what we are seeing in the market. And uh, application software continues to be a pretty big portion of overall tech M and A activity. I think what's driving uh, the the growth in application software is companies have a increased need for providing access to data from anywhere, and that's driving. A, a significant growth in terms of cloud adoption. Uh, Ninety plus percent of the companies are already on the uh, already on the cloud. You're seeing cloud data centers processing uh, close to ninety five percent of the workload. So I think in this environment, you're seeing companies have a need to be to provide access to information to their end cons end users anywhere. Uh, what that has done is, is in terms of the M&A activity in application software, in the second half of, of 2020, we saw $128 billion in M&A activity compared to $21 billion in the second half of 19. So that's a 6x increase in just the second half of last year. That's a pretty big increase. So we are seeing a number of companies being very active in this market, as well as private equity firms. Just a couple of notable transactions. Salesforce acquired Slack for 28.4 billion uh, last year at 36 times revenues. That's a very big multiple and a very sort of uh, game-changing transaction with Salesforce acquiring Slack. You also, we also saw Thoma Bravo acquired RealPage uh, for 10.2 billion at 9.4 times revenues. Again, uh, if we were having this conversation five years ago, most, most people would have said private equity firms would never pay uh, 9.4 times revenues. I think in this market, you're seeing private equity firms almost act like strategics, where if they find a good asset, they're going to, they're going to pay the right value. Uh, so if you're seeing a, a fair amount of activity in, in application software, the next uh, sort of subsector is cybersecurity. I think... Uh, Cybersecurity is a very interesting area. This problem is not going away anytime soon. Uh, there is a ha hacker attack every 39 seconds. So if you think about the amount of uh, attacks, it's, it's growing, by, growing by the day. Uh, the other sort of myth is that uh, people think uh, only large corporations get attacked by hackers. Not true, 43% of the cyber attacks target SMBs, small to medium-sized businesses. So there are a number of small to medium-sized companies who don't have the resources that are getting attacked. Uh, since COVID, the FBI reported a 300% increase in cyber crime. So the number of uh, activity has gone up. And I think that's really, there are, I think what that has done is there is there are a number of uh, uh, 
point solutions in cybersecurity. You have a number of venture firms who have funded a number of startups. It's a very, a very strong sort of subsector within tech. And uh, cybersecurity has seen sort of a fifth straight year of growth. Last year, there were 158 transactions, uh, M&A transactions in the cybersecurity space. Private equity firms continue to be super active in this market. Last year, again, private equity firms did 59 transactions accounting for about 37% of the total volume for cybersecurity deals. Just to uh, give a couple, uh, uh, talk about a notable transaction, Okta, which is a public company, paid 6.5 billion for Auto Zero. Auto Zero was doing about 150 million in revenues could have gone public and got acquired by Okta for 43 times revenues. That's a big multiple. So if you think about the cybersecurity market, there are a number of sort of uh, well-capitalized companies and are looking for acquisitions and it's a very active market. Uh, in terms of the next subsector, we are looking at data center and data center hosting and managed services. I think as you look at the acceleration of digitization, that's really uh, accentuated the needs for hyperscale. I think you, if you look at the amount of data that's being generated, uh, it'll be about 175 zettabytes by the end of 2025. That's uh, increasing at 61% Kager. And if you look at all the data that's and data is basically multi doubling every seven months. So if you look at the amount, the growth in data, it's really uh, increasing the need for uh, edge computing. And I think you're seeing a, as a result, a number of uh, acquisitions in this category. You're seeing a rise in the acquisitions of managed services companies by cloud enablement companies and a consistent uptake in aggregate deal volume since Q1 uh, last year. In terms of notable transactions, EQT, which is a private equity firm based out of Europe, acquired Edge Connects for two and a half billion, a pretty big transaction in this space. And if we continue to see pretty strong m and activity in this market. Um, the next subsector where we're seeing a fair amount of activity is, is IoT. Uh, if you look at the overall sort of IoT market, uh, there will be about 28 billion connected devices by the end of this year. Uh, there is a significant need for data analytics. As you look at the amount of data that's coming from devices, companies want to get more, more insights into what to do with the data and how it can drive sort of better, better uh, outcomes for, for end users. What, what you're seeing is in terms of drivers for growth within IoT, there is the rollout of 5G and a shift towards industry 4.0, which is driving IIoT, industrial IoT deployment. I think there's a pretty big sort of move towards using IoT for commercial deployments. And I think you're seeing a significant uh, amount of M&A activity in this market. In the second half of, of uh, last year, there was over $70 billion of M&A activity in IoT compared to 4.3 billion in the second half of 19. So that's a 16x increase in the M&A activity uh, in, in IoT. In terms of a couple of notable transactions, Teladoc, which acquired Livongo Health for 18 and a half billion at 88 times revenues. Yes, that's 88 times revenues. That's a pretty big multiple. And again, you're seeing companies being very strategic in making acquisitions, which are, which are transformational. Aviva acquired OSI Soft, which is a local software company. They've done a great job in growing the business. Aviva acquired OSI Soft for about 5 billion at 10 times revenues. So again, a very active market. Uh, we have covered a fair amount of information and uh, in terms of uh, sort of summary comments, I would say, I think you, we have seen kind of COVID really change the amount of digital transformation uh, that companies are going through and investments companies are making. We are seeing a very strong M&A market uh, in this environment. And 
the, the M&A market will continue to be strong for the foreseeable future. Uh, Q1 was a record quarter in terms of 300, 305 billion in M&A activity and will likely continue for the rest of the year. SPACs are going to continue to look for targets, but the SPAC market will likely become more selective uh, as we go into the second half of the year. But as we go through a economic recovery and uh, as you start seeing the uh, GDP growth go up for this year, as well as unemployment come down, I think we will likely see a very strong M&A market for the rest of the year and going into 2023. So uh, I know we have covered a lot of, lot of ground, but uh, hopefully that's a helpful uh, overview of kind of our, our, what we are seeing in the market. And I'll pause there and uh, I'll turn it back to Nicola. Mahir, thank you so much. That was a tremendous uh, overview on the update of what has been happening. Certainly not a quiet time period, a lot of great information to cover there. Um, and I think our, our panel up next is gonna be able to dig into some of those remarkable statistics and multiples that you were sharing. So at this point in time, I'd love to introduce to everyone joining us today, our amazing expert panel that we have. We have Andy, partner at KPMG joining us, Kathy, a partner at Wilson Cincini and Emily partner of the national group leader, m and Insurance at Woodruff Sawyer. Um, if I can invite each of you to maybe give a very quick uh, overview of your background and uh, we will get started uh, first with Andy. Great, Thank thanks very much, Nicola. Um, my name is Andy Gersh, I'm a partner at KPMG. Uh, I've been working in the m and space and in technology for about uh, 25 years. I have a broad client base across uh, private equity and corporate, uh, corporate clients. Wonderful, welcome. It's great to have your expertise with us today, Andy. Uh, Kathy, over to you. Hi, thanks for having me, Nicola. Catherine Ku. I'm a corporate and securities partner at Wilson Sonsini in our Los Angeles office. I also had the corporate effort there. Um, as you can tell from what you've seen on here slides in the past year, I've spent probably 95% of my time on SPACs and M&A, which we'll talk about later today. Fantastic. And Emily, um, please welcome again. Great to have you back. A little bit on your background, if you will. Sure. I'm Emily Mayer. I'm the Head of Transactional Insurance for Woodrow Sawyer, uh, which covers reps and warranties, tax opinion, liability, and, and contingent insurance. Fantastic. Well, again, great experts uh, here today to answer your questions on M&A. So please do uh, make sure that you pop them into the Q&A function as we go through. We have some prepared questions, some that were pre-submitted. We'll try to get to as many as we can in our remaining time today. Well, obviously, I feel like I should first start out by saying I hope you're all hanging in there. It has certainly been a volume and some when it comes to the activity that you've all been going on. And clearly, uh, vacations, I hope, at some stage will be in the future. Um, but let's uh, maybe invite each of you to sort of comment on how are, uh, from your perspectives, this uh, current year going? Um, Andy, maybe we'll, we'll start with you. What was it like at the beginning of the year? And here we are now almost hitting May. Has anything changed radically from your perspective? No, I, I, I wouldn't say so. I think it's been, uh, to be frank, it's been insane for about the last six months. Just, just incredible uh, volume of deals. Uh, I, I think at uh, the end of Q4, it was, uh, we, we were starting to see the beginning of sort of stack transactions, but it was very much uh, private equity uh, with a few sort of strategic uh, acquisitions coming through. I think in the last sort of three months, SPAC have, have just, uh, just exploded. Uh, and, but I'll, I know we'll, we'll get on to the SPAC discussion shortly, but I, I suspect that's going to moderate uh, significantly in the next, uh, next short while and we'll start to see a resurgence of corporate, uh, corporate sort of development space. Fantastic. Kathy, Emily, what about from your side? Kathy, we'll start with you. You know, very similar picture to what Andy is describing. Um, I would say, you know, for some of us, we've already seen the SPACs uh, activity really start to moderate severely. Um, so it's interesting to see uh, some of the, the comments from the SEC start to filter through pretty rapidly into the way the players in the market are looking at SPACs as a viable pathway. Um, it's interesting because you see people having quite different reactions to that. So I think this next quarter will be, you know, sort of a, a clarification period to see how the SPAC market really settles out. I mean, otherwise, as I said, very similar to Andy, and I'd say a lot of activity, not just in SPACs, but private equity, strategic. Um, and really interestingly, I think at all valuation sizes. So I think as Mahir was pointing out, 
um, you know, a lot of add-ons happening. And so we're seeing sales happening both at a very low dollar amount that uh, our clients consider strategically very important. And so they're spending, I would say, uh, proportionately more time on those deals than they would have in prior years. And then of course you're seeing the very high end as well, partly driven by the SPACs and the other multiples that Mahira was talking about. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine that. And Emily, I'm, I'm imagining you will round us out by saying uh, ditto, um, but uh, from your side, how, how has uh, the start of the year been and, and how are things going at this point in time? Sure, so like everybody else, the, um, the sort of quiet first quarter is a, is a thing of the past apparently. Um, and uh, it, yes, it's, it's, it's been exhausting, but great. Um, I agree with everybody saying, I think the SEC has made some very interesting comments. I don't, I don't think the warrants issue is, I think it's going to be annoying for the people that are currently in process, but I don't think that's more than a blip. Um, but I think their comments on sort of the ability to, um, well, how, how sort of, um, how people are going to view the ability to sort of forecast um, and the ramifications of when those forecasts fall short uh, is going to potentially have a very big issue. And I think what we're going to see is when, what's going to happen when those forecasts fall short uh, is, is going to sort of be a big impact. And I think, um, I, don't, I don't wish to pick on one particular person, but the Shaq's back, um, I think that Mahir referenced is a, you know, is a sort of not the fourth horseman of the apocalypse, but it's it's not necessarily um, a good sign. So I do think that that will change, but I don't know that it'll necessarily change in the next quarter. Um, but I do see the the same thing that other people are saying that it's sort of we're moving away from the sort of extreme bubble that we were seeing in the first quarter. Yeah, oh, and, and everyone has sort of um, shared comments already on uh, what SPACs has been doing in the M&A uh, domain and, and obviously hot off the press today seems to be unfolding really in real time. Uh, are there any other considerations that are in anyone's uh, visibility right now around considerations of SPACs and M&A for this upcoming quarter as, as the one that we're heading into? Anything that anyone would share as sort of, you know, be mindful of this or we're starting to see a shift on this size or strategy? Andy, Kathy? Andy, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I, I think that the, the SEC pronouncement is um, is very interesting. And I, I think that uh, maybe just to give you some background, what the SEC has come out and said is that we think that the classification of warrants is, is incorrect in, in documents. And, and what that means from a, from a reporting perspective is that uh, SPACs who've published uh, financial statements are, are, will now need to restate. Um, now, there's two, there's two accounting firms who, who have audited 90% of SPACs, um, Markham and Witham, and they just don't have, they, they well, they, they may have, I, I can't speak for them, but I, I suspect they are challenged in their capacity in being able to restate. So you now have a situation where the SEC may prevent SPACs who've announced deals and also SPACs who've got listings but haven't announced deals from actually closing those transactions until they until they restate. And, and I, I think there's, I, I know from uh, there was discussions or there's been there's, there's daily discussions I think between the, the SEC and the big four accounting firms and, and the smaller accounting firms as to how do they resolve this issue um, sort of as expeditiously as possible but still meeting uh, the, the terms of the, the various uh, I can't remember it's the 33 or the 34 Act um, uh, sort of requirements and, and I suspect that's going to essentially put a halt on the SPAC market for, for a short term and in some cases for, for a longer term where, where uh, you know, in, in, to, to be honest, in some cases, it may not just be the, the, the warrants that need to be restated. It may be a much more, it may be a much more in-depth and much more sort of protracted and painful, painful analysis. So uh, I, I think anyone who's, who's anticipating SPACs that are maintaining at the same pace is, is maybe... Um, overly optimistic or extremely optimistic uh, but I, I think you're, you're uh, it, it's going to give us a break for for a couple of months at least uh, albeit the, the accountants restating maybe uh, the, the the level of work may shift from 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 m a to to restatement specialists on the, on the legal and accounting side 
an, an incredibly helpful background and, uh, and, and, and certainly good to know where the bottlenecks and considerations may be flying in the SPACs domain. Um, now, you, you mentioned speed and velocity of, of deals and shifts in timeline. Um, obviously, again, referencing Mahir's slides, it certainly seems that the volume has been high. And so it, it would indicate that the deals are getting done perhaps even quicker uh, than one might have originally thought in 2021. Um, what are you seeing, Andy, right now when it comes to the timeline for deals? And has that shifted at all in this uh, current quarter? Or are we still at an incredible fast pace of going from initial interest all the way through to close? Um, it, it's interesting. I, I was sort of reflecting on that question um, before, and I, to, to be honest, in some cases where it's a, a very active uh, auction situation, which is sort of focused on private equity, I think the the timing from you know initial solicitation or, or selection of the final bidders to to announcement and signing is has become compressed. Um, and I think in some cases, in in a, in a few cases on the corporate side. Uh, there's also a similar sort of shortening of the, of the time frame, but uh, but I would say still on the majority of deals, it it doesn't feel as if it's changed significantly from from uh, within the last year. I think uh, if if a corporate's a, a sole bidder and they've offered a, a, a premium, particularly to some of the smaller smaller startup companies, then then I think uh, corporates are, are taking the same amount of time as they have in the past. Uh, and then on on the growth equity deals, I they, they've always moved fairly quickly, but I I don't feel that they've and there's always exceptions that you can point to, but in most cases, it's uh, I, I don't think it's it's changed significantly. Um, I, I just think what's what's changed is just the, the valuations, which are uh, um, extraordinary. I think is probably the, the best best way to describe them. So. A great catch-all, Andy. Absolutely, I think extraordinary is, is a perfect catch-all for the valuation insights that came out from today and and kind of heading into this as we've seen too. Now, one of the other aspects that um, certainly has become a prominent feature in many conversations of both the startup side and the corporate side is thinking strategically around insurance that is needed to go down the pathway of M&A transactions. Well, Emily, what can you sort of guide us on as far as what shifting in your domain with the these considerations and how are both sides sort of reacting at the insurance layer right now? That's a that's a pretty broad question. Um, I would say if we're talking about, um, you know, if we're talking about specs from an insurance point, the the thing that everybody is talking about is the horrific price of DNA, um, and prior to the business combination, the the main issue is that there is a limited amount of fund in the SPAC and that the price of DMO is so exorbitant right now that it often can take up a substantial amount of the initial fund. Um, and that is, a, that is a real struggle. And there's been a lot of discussion about moving to side A only programs um, because the amount of deductible that is on SPAC DMO programs is so high that the SPAC would become bankrupt before it was ever able to reach that retention. And so there's really no point in having DNO that is anything other than side A. And there's a lot of debate and um, discussion about that in the industry. The, the go forward uh, after the business combination is just as expensive, but at that point there is a combination. And so you have access to the, the funds of the company that's just been acquired. And so it's, it's less of a, concern right it's not pleasant to pay that kind of money for insurance but it's actually feasible to do so because you have the access to that fund i'd say if we're also talking because it's a very broad range of people if we're also talking about looking to buy or sell in the ordinary course i think one of the things that Mahir pointed out in terms of trends and that certainly we're seeing in the ref and warranty market and we're seeing in our own business and that we're seeing everywhere is cyber security, um, cyber insurance, and the enormous problems that are being caused there. Um, and from a record warranty perspective, but also if I was thinking of either buying or selling a company, um, there is a massive amount of under insurance um, in small to medium sized companies right now. Um, and we are often coming up against when we're looking at an acquisition that a company is, is um, inadequately insured and or has no insurance for cyber. Um, and for those of you that are not super insurance nerds, 
the revenue warranty insurance policy usually sits excess the targets existing insurances and so if there's no cyber insurance you've got nothing to sit excess so you'll end up with a sort of horrible exclusion so and this has come up habitually on small to medium sized enterprise acquisitions and there is a lag between people's small to medium sized enterprise understanding of what their cyber risk is and what it actually is so i think mahir's point was very well made um, that when we are looking at acquisitions, especially in the tech market, um, we will very often come across a seller that say, well, we don't have a cyber exposure, so we don't have a policy. Actually, you have a massive cyber exposure, not necessarily because your exposure per se is massive, but the cost of fixing it is massive. Um, and you don't have penetration testing. And for all you know, someone's been sitting in your server for the last six months, and you have no idea. So um, and in terms of sort of the costs of protecting yourself, um, they're going up constantly. And so I would say from a, you know, spec thing, the biggest sort of cost item that I think everybody's worrying about is DNO. And I think from a, I am a small growing entrepreneurial company that is thinking about exiting, or I am interested in buying small to medium sized companies, um, cyber insurance is the thing that's going to be surprising and painful. If that's, if that's the question you're asking. Yeah, that was fantastic. <laughs> Kathy, you were going to add in there. I was going to say, may I ask Emily a question? You know, I, her, I take her point. It's, it's well taken about cyber exposure. You know, I've seen deals where we've actually had to, as on the buy side, have had to have the target buy, and it's quite difficult a standalone cyber policy to fill that hole because otherwise the DNO insurer won't come in because as Emily said, they have nothing access to sit on top of in terms of the base risk. But we've started to see another pattern, um, particularly with these small add-ons. Mm -hmm. If they're on the larger end, let's call it sort of medium, mm -hmm. um, we started to see insurers take a more skeptical point of view about insuring deals where there aren't actually audited financial statements, AICPA. Um, and, you know, I've always seen that skepticism before where maybe you'll get carve outs or limitations of the financial statements wrap. You know, for those in the audience, I'm sure everyone knows, but oftentimes that's where buyers make claims is on the financial statements. And so a question for Emily about what she's seeing in that particular area, because I recently even heard about an insurer just refusing to ensure if there were not going to be audited financials, which poses a really interesting question in the context of a totally private deal for a small to medium acquisition, um, you know, whether you can tolerate that kind of timeline as opposed to in a public, private or public, public deal. Sure, it's a great question. Um, I was actually gonna talk later on about um, where claims come in mm. um, and it's a skewed statistic, but 55% of claims come in on financial statements. Um, and it's a, it's a skewed um, statement because claims that come in in financial statements also come in in other areas, right? Um, something is a, a breach of something. It's also a breach of the financial statements and things are discovered in the first audit that come in under financial statements. So they get the hardest hit. Um, I'm, I'm amazed to hear you say that insurance carriers are skeptical. Um, I've always found them to be very open-hearted, but um, the, what I would say is the, the rule historically has been um, that if there weren't audited financials, there needed to be a Q of V. I have now found that because there is so many cla and claims have got really um, um, extreme is the wrong word basically the market has done very well for a number of years we are now getting to a place where um, losses are exceeding premium for the first time and most of those are being driven by um, financial statements claims and um, so even when there is a Q of V there are certain underwriting markets that will still not touch unaudited accounts. Now, those I'd say are, are few and far, far between. There are, the vast majority of markets will still cover unaudited 
if there is a Q of E. If you do not have, and we're going through this right now with a, with a company, they did not have audited financials and they did what was essentially a Q of E internally. And what we did was get a scope of work and we got a sense of who the individuals were that worked at the firm. And we got the underwriter to sign off on that scope of work prior to commencing diligence. And that was the way we found to sort of save them the cost of and time of going out and getting a big four to do a third party on what was essentially a non-revenue generating company because it becomes ridiculous at that point. Um, and also on a pure asset sale, right? It becomes ridiculous at that point or a spin out. So what we find is, is makes sense is we get a very clear scope. We get a very clear sense of who's doing that work. Um, and we get sign off at the MBIL stage to avoid surprises later on because obviously in my line of work all we're about is avoiding surprises later on <laughs> emily uh, really quickly apologies i should know this qov stands for sorry quality of earnings perfect thank you and, and if you want to know more about that you have to ask andy because it confuses the <laughs> out of me once we get beyond the letters andy for the next part yeah. and then the ndil that you referenced that stands for is that oh, non-binding indication letter which is sort of a fancy way of saying quote perfect thank you so much for that clarification and um, kathy you, the, that inference that you just kind of went through and sort of sharing of the what you've been seeing um is just staying with you for a moment have you seen any other trends that have shifted in in your environment over the last year and if so what are some of those indications that are coming in that have been surprising or maybe just a little unexpected so it, it's interesting. Um, I am on the sell side as much as, or maybe more than on the buy side. And so for me, what's been surprising for the first time is to see, you know, and this is just a reflection of all the market trends that the panel and the here have been talking about, the amount of capital that's in the market that's looking for a place to work. But for me, I'm starting to see a real convergence between sellers and buyers. And by that, I mean, you know, if I'm representing someone who's ostensibly a target, they're at the same time thinking about their strategic options as a buyer, either on their own, through another financing with their existing investors, through a SPAC, um, you know, and I, so it's interesting because you're starting to see this convergence of the players. I think Mihir is talking about people weighing their options. They're really weighing their options. So there's a lot of people sort of standing on the precipice and looking at the way things are unfolding and trying to think about how you multi-track and evaluate your options. And I, I haven't seen that kind of convergence between the buy side and the sell side, the finance side, you know, and the target side um, ever in my career to this degree. So it, that's a very interesting dynamic to see people have to stand on both sides of the table um, and think about, you know, how they feel about their future in a company. Um, the other thing I'd say, and this is different from Andy's experience and that should be taken into account, you know, everyone's practice is different. For me, um, most of my deals don't have a normal pattern anymore in terms of time frame. Um, they're either very short and truncated because people are trying to avoid the uncertainty of an auction situation or they're trying to get out ahead of the pipe market that used to be the thing to get ahead of um, in the SPAC you know, market before. Now it's get out ahead of, I don't know, restatement, big R, little R. Um, but they're either very short because people are trying to reduce uncertainty in the process or they've actually gotten quite long. And I think one of the reasons why <clears throat> some processes have gotten quite long is because buyers know there are so many other buyers out there and these strategic add-ons are very meaningful. And so, as I said earlier, you know, you're seeing um, buyers spend a disproportionate amount of time on transactions, I think, because they've become so important in this environment to be accretive to the platform you're building, you know, either if you're the corporate itself <clears throat> or if you're a sponsor. And so you see people really hanging in there, for lack of a better word, on transactions that have gotten quite difficult, either because of the stage and the profile of the target, as great as they are. So to Emily's point, you know, having to be creative, think about getting a QOE in a company you normally wouldn't have thought about and, you know, finding a way around that and working through that. Um, I, I just don't see buyers, frankly, letting go of 
sort of the one-off negotiated situations as often as I would have before. Interesting. And anything about deal terms um, from your site that has been surprising or interesting to sort of uh, consider over the last, let's say, two to three quarters? I would say, you know, a much harder push by sellers to get a public company style deal, i.e. rather than have a private company's uh, traditional private company deal with reps and warranties that survive the closing, you know, where the sellers have ongoing liability after the closing, and perhaps they try to limit that by going to someone like Emily and getting a rep and warranty insurance policy. I see sellers pushing very, very hard for a public company walkway deal where you're just selling the company. You don't have anything lingering after the fact short of fraud or intentional misrepresentation. Um, it's, it's a very interesting situation when you're a buyer and you're trying to think about your opportunity costs and you're weighing that risk. Yeah, absolutely. Any, what about from your side? Any, any shifts that have happened radically on deal terms? And, uh, and then maybe if I can also invite you to comment on sort of the differential in international deals and domestic deals, anything that has sort of hit your radar screen on that side of the house too. Yeah, I, I think just to, just to build on, on Kathy's last point, um, it, it is interesting how sellers have moved away from, uh, and this is from, from an accounting perspective, uh, let's say a traditional, you could say networking capital arrangement and true up of cash and debt at the, at the closing of the transaction to, to more of a lockbox arrangement where the sellers, particularly if they're, if they're uh, sort of VC or private equity, are getting certainty as to the proceeds at, at closing. And so they, they, they'll maybe sort of um, forego or, or be a rarely forego a little bit of consideration to get that, that certainty rather than having a potential sort of protracted uh, or extended uh, settlement period post deal. So that's that's definitely uh, something something new that it's been in Europe for a while, but it's it's uh, now I'd say it's much more common in the US, and I'm, I'm probably seeing it on close to to probably thirty or forty percent of the deals that I'm I'm seeing just now. I, I think in terms of the, the domestic and international, it's it's interesting because. Uh, technology clients, whether large or small, have always been much more open to, to doing international transactions because there's, there's always interesting technology they could pick up in Europe or, or, or in Asia. I, I think the sort of COVID lockdown has, it, ha, has had an impact on that where uh, deal makers and, and, see, and senior management have always enjoyed traveling. It's, it's, you know, it's fun to go to Europe for a few days. And I, I think that was may, maybe part of the reason for some of the international sort of transactions and and with the, the sort of inability for most individuals to travel, that, that, that has reduced the number of, uh, of international deals. And then I, I think if you, if you look at the domestic situation in the US, it's, uh, it, it, there's, the saying is never bet against America. And I think it's, it's true just now, there's so much optimism in the market, and there's so much money. So you're, you're, you're just getting, uh, you're, you're just, you've just got a much more active deal market here and, and companies and, and private equity and venture capital haven't had the same need to go and, um, you know, to go and explore transactions elsewhere. I, I think that's, it's definitely been the case in the last quarter or two. I, I, I think as the world starts to catch up with, with the US and as you start seeing more, more sort of funding and more stimulus money coming into particularly Europe, I, I think you'll start to see, a, a, you'll, you'll start to see at least a, an expansion of, of M&A activity or outbound investment from the US into, into Europe, but just now um, much more heavily sort of domestically focused than, than in the past. Mm, really helpful to know, thank you for that. Um, Emily, how are providers right now sort of measuring risk from an insurance perspective? And then maybe for our entrepreneurs out there, what are the steps that they can take perhaps to help mitigate some of that risk? Sure, I think the again, that's an in, incredibly broad question. Um, and the best way for me to answer it, I think, is through the, the lens of my own specialty, which is rep and warranty insurance. Um, I think, as I was alluding to earlier, if we look at, um, in terms of buying and selling companies, um, if we look at sort of where claims are coming in, in terms of industry, and where they're coming in in terms of breaches, by you know, by in terms of uh, risky industries, in terms of 
which industries are producing the most claims from breaches of rapid monitoring insurance, um, sort of recently. Um, and this is sort of pre-COVID and into COVID. Um, I would say what we're going to start seeing, because there's always a time lag, but it's, it's predominantly financial services, then technology, um, then we've got um, healthcare, life sciences, um, and then manufacturing and retail are way down. Um, so it is, and if we look at, at what is causing those, and this was interesting to me, um, as we were discussing earlier, um, financial statements is, you know, miles ahead of everybody else, um, but that is not fair. Um, then we've got things like employment, employment benefits, compliance with laws, which is a massive scope. Um, intellectual property and tax are pretty high up there. Um, material contracts and material contracts are particular concern and are being looked at very strongly in the COVID era because that is where you see COVID showing up, right? Because that is around um, your suppliers failing to be able to meet supply. It's your, it's your um, buyers suddenly not being able to buy anymore. Um, so I expect to see more of that environmental, operational. What was surprising to me is 14% is fundamental. Um, and I always think of fundamental as an almost non-existent category. Um, because while it is a catastrophic problem, um, it's, it's usually straightforward to uh, diligence. What I think is behind that number is there is a creep, in my opinion, towards other things being pushed into the fundamental bucket. Um, so I think that is where we're seeing things like, you know, compliance with laws and IP being sort of shimmied into fundamental otherwise that doesn't make sense to me at all because if you can't work out whether you own that someone can't work out whether they're being sold something that's actually been owned by someone or not we have a bigger problem so um i think and i have a bridge that i would like to sell you so um uh i think um you know if you are looking to sell or if to understand the process when an underwriter is looking at rep and warranty. They are looking at two things to work out whether you are risky or not risky. They are looking at the SPA to work out who is the, the skeleton of the, is the SPA is the skeleton of the risk. Who's going to get blamed if something goes wrong? How is that loss going to be defined? Who's going to be on the hook and how ugly is it going to get? And that they're going to find that out from things like the definition of loss, how big is the materiality scrape? Is there a knowledge scrape? This sort of thing. And that, that and the, the reps themselves, and that tells them who's got sort of the stronger position. And it tells them if something goes wrong, who's going to get in trouble and what it's going to look like. And then they do diligence on the diligence. So they see how hard the tires have been kicked to see that all of the skeletons that should have been found have been found and that they're only on the hook for that which is genuinely fortuitous. So if you are looking to protect yourself, either as a buyer or a seller, then disclosure, disclosure, disclosure as a seller is the best way to protect yourself because everything that is known, right, isn't covered and you can't be harassed for. Um, and as a buyer, I guess I suppose the opposite, but I couldn't say that. But um, <laughs> Um, you know, the, the more buttoned up your diligence is, the more thoroughly you have done your job, the broader coverage you will get, right? And so if anything does come up, um, the, the better your policy will respond. So I think um, in terms of protecting yourself in an M&A situation, honestly, a very, a very thorough process. And as a seller, having your ducks in a row, having a really good set of books and records, having a very well-run company, to be honest, as boring as that answer is, is the best way to protect yourself from problems going forward after the sale. 
Um, not an exciting answer, but I think um, probably the truth. Yeah, well, and, and, but it's great tactics all the way around, right? Because the intentionality of the exit drives the process and the policies and the considerations much earlier than the transaction date. So yes. I think what you're suggesting along the way is don't wait to the 11th hour to try to make it all work. Start a lot, lot earlier in order to really guide that in those kind of outcomes and those kind of offerings, right? Right, it's always the, the um, problem. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you guys go, 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 Emily. No, the, the problem is always um, when you can't find something to prove that you've done something. Yeah. So when there's a bit of paper missing because somebody didn't file it or you can't find the record of something, that's when we have an unsolvable problem. So, um, you know, it, it is the Cathy's and the Andy's yeah. of this world that will um, give you the advice and help you remember to save the right bit of paper in the right place. Or just save it for you. Just let them save it for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Um, you know, Kathy, I think um, we can look at individual transactions, many of which uh, were called out on that initial market landscape as really interesting and um, Obviously, a lot of curiosity that would love to know, fly on the wall, what was going on behind the scenes around some of the deal terms that were going there. But from your perspective, do you think deals are actually normalizing more in 2021? And, and as far as the uniqueness of the deals, how is that sort of unfolding as we look ahead to this coming quarter? Um. I guess your guess is as good as mine is not the right answer. Um, I actually don't <laughs> see things normalizing very much in 2021, but the reason why I don't is because I, you know, we talked, we talked earlier about how it feels to me, you know, for my particular client base, where there's a lot of both buyers and sellers, investors and issuers standing on the precipice and looking at all of the optionality and trying to figure out the right path, particularly when many of those paths are in, in flux, right? Um, you know, these facts, for example, um, and which is just to say in that kind of situation, which is highly dynamic, people are trying to figure out what comes next. People are going to make very different decisions um, based on their predictions about how things are going to normalize or not normalize. And I think in a way, so that's my way of saying, I think there's going to be a lot of foment and froth to work through before we get to a place that we would call normal. I mean, we're in a situation, and not to keep going back to these facts, but I think they're the you know the clearest illustration in the present moment. In the last week and a half, I've heard everything from uh, "Don't worry, things are going to be fine." A DSPAC is still the fastest way to take you public while also achieving you know a strategic acquisition. To don't talk to me about a DSPAC. You know, I've spoken to my banker, and it's a four-letter word the way it was ten years ago. And so when you see that broadest span and you think about all the incremental decisions people are making in between, I mean, it's such a broad span, right? Um, I think of normalization as the span is, is fairly this wide and you're making incremental decisions, but we're in a very different environment. Um, so to answer your question, your first one at least, no, I don't see things normalizing, um, at least not in the next quarter. Um, and it feels as though for the rest of the year, given the amount of capital pushing into the market, it's going to continue to be very, very active and therefore, from my point of view, not normal um, because everyone's jockeying for optionality and opportunity. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great segue. We've had a number of questions that have come up into the Q&A and rather than wait for a few more minutes to sort of address them, I, I would like to take maybe just a minute or two to go a little deeper around this SPAC issue that has obviously come in. And, and the questions really are around trying to understand the impact on M&A transactions where a company may have already gone through a SPAC merger or is looking to acquire a private startup. Um, from your perspectives, uh, Kathy, Emily, would love to invite you. You know, what are the considerations around this specific uh, SEC uh, announcement that has come out with the SPAC issue? Kathy, do you want to start? Well, so there have been a so I'll sort of take the accounting point and put that to the side because I think Andy gave a really good assessment. You know, from my perspective on the real impact of that. I think, um, you know, acting director Coates coming out and speaking to the securities law implications of being in a DSPAC transaction to go public as opposed to an IPO, where essentially he said, 
you know, people are focusing far too much on the differences as opposed to seeing the commonalities, which is at the end of the day, one way or another, you're going to be speaking to a market of potential investors. You're going to be public, you know, in that particular forum. And therefore we see are going to be applying a very close eye to your disclosures and whether you're, you know, uh, you're giving investors the appropriate amount of information in order to get to the place you want to be, which is to be a public company. Um, I think, and I'll say this, I think hopefully that will crystallize for people what some of us have been saying all along, which is this isn't a shortcut. You know, it's a different path, but it's not a shortcut. And it's, it's frankly a path that is rife with similar risks as an IPO and some very different ones, which um, aspiring public companies don't fully understand because the risks that relate to the kinds of fiduciary duty problems and conflicts of interest that you really tend to see in pure play M&A as opposed to an IPO. And so, you know, it's quite important that companies who are thinking about different paths that may include a DSPAC do speak with lawyers about how different uh, this path is from an IPO in addition to the fact that they are not escaping IPO you know, like consequences from an SEC point of view. And my understanding, and maybe I'm coming off the right, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but, but my understanding is essentially in the, the SPAC group, it was treated more as sort of a more traditional M&A and that you felt more free to make statements and projections around what you thought you could do and you can make statements around, um, but we think we'll do 100 million of revenue in the first year. And then when you do 2 million of revenue in the first year, you are not liable to be sued in the same way that you would if you made the same statements in an IPO registration statement. And that if they are going to look at this in the same way as an IPO registration statement, um, the fact that you've all wandered forth and made these bold prognostications um it's now going to be you know it's 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 going to be a less attractive option if firstly you don't feel you can just say whatever you feel like saying um and secondly once you start coming up short there's going to be a lot of there's a word for it something like empty companies where basically the share value just evaporates and you're left with a big old handful of nothing um, and then the bottom drops out of the SPAC market in general because a few have taken a nosedive. Uh, I may be being grossly simplistic. Andy and Kathy, explain why I'm being grossly simplistic. No, you're not. If I could just jump in and Andy, I, here's what I would say to everyone in the mm -hmm. audience who's, who's trying to sort of sort through what we're saying. And this is the most simplistic way to think of it of all. If you're going out and selling the company or you're going out and you're doing an IPO, in either situation, the management team is going to put together projections for the company's future performance because you want to prove out your business case, you know, support your valuation. And what people think of in an IPO context is, yes, they'll have to prove out those projections with the bankers, but those numbers will never enter the public domain. By contrast, in a DSPAC, those numbers will go into the book that's filed publicly. People will see them, and so you will have to live with them. And that is a just a key basic difference between DSPAC and traditional IPO that from management's perspective can be incredibly chilling, you know, if they think about what that really means for them in life as a new public company. Andy. Yes, before, sorry. No, 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 all good. Before I, I turn to that very fun conversation at hand around valuations. Is there anything that you wanna add in sort of uh, the considerations that have been coming forward from the SEC? A couple of questions have come in from the audience, really just trying to get clarity and understanding around how is this gonna impact uh, m and transactions going forward and what sensitivities do they need to be mindful of? So the background that we just went through has been incredibly helpful to sort of give people a greater sense of understanding as to what is really at risk here and what is really being considered differently. Yeah, I, I think maybe just a couple of points. There's a day of reckoning coming on specs, and and uh, it's uh, that, that day of reckoning is some of the directors of some of these companies are going to be um, prosecuted by the SEC. I just have to imagine it for for putting out uh, maybe projections and filings that aren't based on on reality. Um, and I think there's 
SPACs and the, the management team and the companies that are being bought by SPACs are now recognizing that in a way their, their documents and, and the, becoming a public company through a sort of SPAC mechanism is no different than a regular IPO and they, they're, they're bound by, by the, the criteria. Uh, it, well, it, it's different, but it's, it's basically you're, you're still a public company. You've still got uh, fiduciary duties and, and uh, requirements. And, and I think that uh, there's now a dawning of the mar- on the, upon the market and some of these specs that this is, this is what's happening. And I think the, the free for all and the kind of the get rich quick mentality is, is, uh, is quickly deflating um, in, in, among the specs. Um, you know, just in terms of valuation, it is interesting. I was, uh, the, the specs have, have definitely pumped up the market and that's because in a way they're, if you think about the economic incentives in a SPAC, they, they raise money, they've got to deploy it in two years. If, if they don't deploy it, then they, they don't make any profit. If they deploy it and, and you know, they fail, it's not their responsibility. If they, if they deploy it and succeed, they're, they're heroes. So you've, got no, you've almost got no constraints on SPACs that sort are of spending the money. So they're willing to, to, have just, to sort of pay much, much higher multiples than anyone else. Because it's uh, it's a bet. If if, uh, if it pays off again, they're heroes, and if it fails, nothing happens. Uh, saying that, I think in the broader market, the other the other um, aspect that, uh, I, I, that that I, I hadn't really thought about until in, in, until until you start seeing the valuations is just interest rates are so low, and a lot of the growth in the market you could almost say over the last uh, really last twenty or thirty years has come from. From a reduction in interest rates and and investors willing to take a lower a lower return because interest rates are, are, have crept down to essentially negative interest interest rates at this point. I, I think that's going to start last for for at least another year or so. That the Fed's uh, clearly communicated that there's going to be a that they're going to try and hold interest rates um, at, at effectively at zero for as long as possible. Um, you're also seeing just a huge amount of stimulus money coming into the market. And, and you're also seeing pension funds have to have to get uh, ha- have to get returns, so they're they're betting on uh, on a sort of maybe a moderated growth in the stock market, but they're, they're chasing any any kind of return they can, which they're not getting on on uh, treasuries, which are, are down in the sort of one percent range at, at the most, and really a, a negative when you when you take into account uh, the likely current inflation rate. So, so I, I suspect unless there's a, a catastrophic event in the market, unless you you uh, see some sort of, unless you see a disruption, you know, akin to a, a sort of Lehman Brothers um, episode in, in 2008, I think you'll you'll see. Um, is it 2008, 2007? I think you'll see. Uh, I think you'll see this continued high valuation for at least the next next year or two. Very good sign of the times. Um, all right, so we're going to be transitioning here to live Q and A in just a minute. But before we do that, fun question that we always like to end on: What is a one key takeaway that you want people listening to you today to sort of walk away feeling empowered with? Uh, Kathy, I'm going to start with you. Emily will go next, and Andy, I'll have you round us out. So, mm-hmm. Kathy, what's the takeaway that you want people to think about today? You know, I think people should feel empowered to ask hard questions of their advisors not just technical hard questions, but I think it's really good to ask your advisors for their judgments, uh, which are you know, what Andy and Emily are sharing today, what I'm trying to share. You may not agree with those judgments, but I think having an advisor who's willing to share sort of their broad takeaway of the circumstances that you're in uh, is an important part of, of going into a DSPAC or an M&A or any other you know, strategic situation that you may be thinking about at this point. Great insight, thank you for that. Emily? I think um, Kathy's point was really valid. I think this is a time of more options than ever before. And um, we're all finding our way a little bit in this new time. So yes, ask hard questions and, and remember that you probably have more options than you think. Um, you know, and uh, sometimes doing nothing is also an option. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I think it's a it, it's a very attractive market, and and uh, you know people are making a lot of money. And when when there's a lot of money, you, you get bad actors. 
And I think if, if uh, people, whether they're looking at a buy or a sell side transaction, just, just think about who your counterparty is and, and do they have a good reputation? Do you trust them? Can you, you know, don't, don't shy away from spending money on, on background checks with some of the, the, the sort of maybe more investigative agencies, particularly if you, if you haven't heard of these, uh, these individuals before. And I, I think um, try not to get blinded by, by greed. It's, it's uh, I, I definitely get the sense that there's, a, there's uh, we're, we're going to start seeing more cases of fraud and and um, coming through in the next year or two, just because there's, there's so much money and, and where there's money, you, uh, you, you'll, you'll get uh, you'll get bad behavior. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, on that insight and advice of like all questions welcome, ask questions of our experts. We're going to try to go rapid fire now for the next 10 minutes or so and really get to as much as we can. So thank you for all of you who have contributed and populated questions. And for those still wondering and wondering if I should put that question in, please do. We'll try to get to as many as we can. So up first, um, uh, Paolo asked a great question around the standard exit multiple in terms of gross revenue, um, specifically in this case around health tech, but any sort of advice or guidance you can offer around what you're seeing right now when it comes to the exit multiples uh, for revenue valuations. Andy, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you want to take that one to start with? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I wish Mahir was, was still on. He's probably a bit more qualified. I'm seeing uh, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's all over the place. I've got uh, one transaction just now that's uh, supposedly not, not highly rated. It's going for eight times revenue. Um, sort of forward-looking revenue in other cases I, i've seen uh on on sort of private company deals up to up to 20 or 30 times so i think it's it's really just a uh, it, it's a function of how how persuasive the seller can be in terms of the the, the growth opportunity and the and the total total market that uh, the, the particular uh, entity might be able to to capture Interesting, interesting. Um, we had another question that was coming in really looking at um, guidance on the percentages, and I think this is open to the panel, around what you're seeing of transactions that are acquirer initiated versus seller initiated. Um, I, I don't know if anyone sort of wants to comment, but I think definitely, Kathy, from your side, there's more options than ever, right? So it would feel like maybe fairly balanced, but is that what you're seeing out there right now? And, and are there any insights that you can point people to to kind of keep an eye on the trends as they're happening in that area? I was going to say, I do think it's fairly balanced, but I think um, to sort of go back to some of the things I said, it, there's this gray zone in the middle, the squish zone, where it's actually sort of a, a mutually fueled thing where a company will receive an inbound um, and that will start to gestate, you know, the thinking on the board among the management, okay, we've got this one inquiry, we've got this one person who's been hanging around, what does that really mean about our attractiveness in the market? Do we need to go out and test? And so sometimes the one-off can actually be generative of more of an auction situation that's intended to go broader. Um, and similarly, you know, I talked earlier about compressed deadlines. Sometimes you start off with an auction and you end up cutting it off early in order to go with a one-off, you know, who wants to preempt the auction and having to bid on you competitively. So, you know, I would say fairly balanced understanding that there's this middle zone where they're really more interactive than they necessarily seem. Fantastic. Really good insights. Um, Emily, a quick question coming in around resources for cyber insurance for small businesses. Anything that you would point to? I know there's some great blogs covered with uh, Woodruff Sawyer. Any other tips and tricks to sort of keep an eye on what to do when it comes to cyber insurance for those, you know, who are just engaging in that process? Sure, I would say, and obviously I'm going to say this, but CyberDan at uh, Woodrow Sawyer actually does a weekly blog where he talks about recent events. Um, and I would start there. I would start with, there are a lot of good, um, there's a, the, the thing is it's one of those areas where there is a massive amount of information and I think it's very easy to get lost. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would pick one or two um, blogs or speakers that I found particularly interesting and I would follow them for a period of time um, rather than diving into lots of different things all at once. Um, I would also, you know, I would start um, a conversation. Um, it depends whether your interest is in cybersecurity and consultancy for your firm or insurance or getting into the cybersecurity business. But I would say that's a very broad range. 
So I would pick one or two experts and start listening and sort of slowly working into the topic. If you are particularly interested in cyber insurance, obviously let me know and I will hook you up. But um, apart from Cyber Dan, um, I can also reach out to him and ask him who he likes to listen to because um, I'm sure he listens to a lot of people and give you some recommendations for sort of an easy entryway into that world because it's completely confusing. <laughs> Thanks, Emily, for understanding that daunting task and also for the great resources. Much appreciated. Um, Todd asks a great question uh, and, and kind of inviting Andy and Kathy maybe to, to sort of think through. Can you talk more about how private deals are structured without a working capital adjustment? Uh, are there debt liability caps? And for those public company style deals for private companies, are there escrows or are there truly no recourse other than R&W insurance? Um, Andy, Kathy, whoever kind of want to take that, but I think that's a, a lot in there to unpack. Well, why don't I start with the escrow question and then we can back into Andy, you know, the question about the working capital. Um, when I say public company style deal, I mean a true public company style deal, which is the reps and warranties expire at the closing. And so the only remaining liability uh, for those reps and warranties would be if you had committed fraud or intentional misrepresentation. Now, as in all things M&A, you can see some very slight tweaks. So for example, maybe um, fundamentals will, will survive and nothing else. And then the question becomes, as Emily alluded to earlier, well, what's really fundamental? You know, where are you gonna uh, squeeze in there depending on whether you're a buyer or seller that wouldn't necessarily be picked up in that traditional term of the word. But when I say public company style, I really do mean it's a walk away from uh, liability and reps and warranties uh, in, the, in the document. And then um, just in terms of the working capital, when, when you refer to a public company deal, if you think about it, you, you, you buy a public company for uh, X dollars a share and you, you get what you get and you, you don't get upset. In, in a way for private companies, how they, how they sort of structure it is you, you know, let, let's assume you, you've got a deal that's gonna close on June 30th. You, you buy the company as of uh, December 31st, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example. And you value your your debt, your cash, your networking capital um, as of that particular particular date, and you make any adjustments as of that date through the purchase price. You come up with, um, let's say, your company's worth hundred million dollars with with all with it all in. And then often, what I'll see is is bidders or or um, the the two parties will work out uh, an effective, let's say, daily rate or ticking fee from. From this, from the December thirty first date to to the the close date, which you know maybe maybe June thirtieth, maybe a, a few weeks before or or after, uh, but you might say for every every day that uh, it, it goes beyond December thirty first, we'll add an extra thousand dollars to the to the purchase price. So every the, the buyer knows what they they and 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 sorry just to just to clarify, and that thousand dollars is to compensate the seller for the performance of the business. From the from this lockbox date to the closing date, and the, the cash that they're generating in that in that period sits within the company. Of course, if it's if they're losing money, you might go the other way, and you might say that the purchase price is reduced for every day that through close. But I, I rarely see that that type of mechanism. So everybody's got certainty as to what the proceeds are, and again, it's there's no you, the, the buyer will look at the at the closing balance sheet, what is acquired, but uh, there's no incentive for the seller to manipulate working capital or debt or or or, or cash. They know what they're going to get paid, and theoretically, it reduces the the risk of of you know fraud or litigation post closing. So, uh, to the extent the seller is not a bad actor, uh, he or she gets gets their their um, their consideration, and and off they go. Really helpful, Andy. Thank you, and Kathy, both for those insights. Um, question had come in, sort of trying to understand any stats around those categories that have been considered high risk areas. Emily, don't want to put you on the spot, but anything that you can kind of articulate, Kathy, anything that you can kind of call out around what that means and what is included there and how often it happens? Do you mean the um, industries? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Sure. So the, my stats were taken from a particular um, report that was written by Lowenstein Sanders, which I'm particularly fond of. There are a number of claims reports, um, but they're usually produced by um, insurance companies. 
and forgive me, but um, I believe that therefore they are a little bit self-serving. Um, <laughs> and um, Lowenstein Standards is um, a law firm that specializes in um, rep and warranty insurance um, litigation. So um, this is sort of the, these are the, the industries that have generated the most pain. So, um, and um, they um, have, um, you know, and so theirs are, uh, their sort of figures come with caveats and some of theirs have um, double counting. So for instance, technology can also be financial services. Right. So um, and, and, you know, they make the and, and because they're staggered. Um, so, you know, the, it usually takes a year for claims. Sorry, it usually takes a year for claims to show up. And because financial services and technologies were early adopters, you're also going to see cumulatively more claims in those areas. So mm -hmm. with those caveats in mind, we've got financial services at sort of 72%. We've got technology at 43%, healthcare at 41, life sciences at 35, manufacturing at 30, retail at 21, and other is two. So um, there, are a, there are a lot of resources for claims data. They interestingly all show roughly the same thing. We are working on, of course, our own um, claims report. Um, we're very lucky. We have um, a lot of. Uh, we've uh, we've got a claims team that has. Uh, I like to think of it as liberated over a uh, hundred million dollars of of rep and warranty uh, claims money from the market, and uh, we're working on our own version, which will probably come out roughly the same as everybody else's, but. Um, but ours will be better. But, um, <laughs> but there, is, there are overarching patterns um, and I am happy to provide to anybody a broad array of, this is AIGs, this is Lowenstein Sanders, this is so-and-sos, which will give you sort of a broad range of, these are the statistics over the course of the last few years that show you different variations. I like Lowenstein's because it also shows how many of those claims were within the retention? How often did you have to call in a third party? How often did you have to go back and keep badgering the underwriter before they actually paid you? Yeah. That sort of stuff, um, which funnily enough, the insurers never show. So, um, so I find that one, um, you can send me money later, Lowenstein. Um, <laughs> I find that one to be the most famous uh, of uh, the claims reports. Amazing. All right, guys. Well, we are almost out of time, but I'm going to try to squeeze one last one in here. Uh, team, forgive me, but I, I think it's a nice one to sort of end on. And, and it is just this, this, you know, in, in your opinions, what are the biggest risks and also the opportunities post COVID when it comes to thinking about acquisitions? Let's round out our conversation today with that. Uh, whoever wants to start and then we're going to go round Robin. Uh, and again, thank you so much for all your time and insights today. You know, I think I'm actually going to repeat something that Andy said earlier, which I thought was um, a really important thing for everyone to keep in mind, which is, do you trust your partner, not your legal partner, right? But do you trust the person on the other side of the table? And by trust, we don't mean, you know, they're going to do everything for you in the deal, but are they basically honest and straightforward? And if they're investing in you, are they going to be good partners in growing your business together? Um, I think as much as you know, we're liberated by uh, remote access and, and you know, that sort of thing, where we can all sort of bridge across vast space, there's something about being in person and reassuring about looking into the eyes of someone across the table. It's not necessarily more reliable, but it's instinctually more reassuring. And I, I think that in that respect, striking deals in the current environment is tough. I, I think people have, um... I think they've accepted there's going to be maybe a slightly higher mortality rate or risk in life with COVID um, versus the the sort of the, 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 I think at the start of COVID everyone wanted to to eliminate risk, um, and I think people are I, I think we're going to be rushing back to the offices to our offices as quickly as we can and back on the road. 
not not maybe not because we like traveling a lot but just to, just to get away from our kids and my, my kids <laughs> and my kids in particular and, uh, but, uh, and, and, re and really uh, back back to uh, back, back to seeing sort of friends and colleagues so. mm -hmm. business and person I love it Emily so I have I have to say I agree as as convenient as zoom is there is something there's a lot to be said for sitting face to face that you just can't get over zoom and I think Andy's point is very well taken where there's a lot of money there is there is malfeasance and you really you really need to trust people that you're getting into business with and when there's a lot of money on the table it's easy to get blinded um and so I think the the opportunities remain finding good people and on that fantastic note, finding good people, I know we didn't get to every question out there today, but I, I have good news. Uh, if we didn't, you can still connect with our experts. They've generously offered uh, their availability, their time and their insights. So please go ahead and uh, take that poll. If you wanna follow up with any of our experts today, we'll organize those follow-ups. Uh, we'll get those lists out and we'll get you connected with the network that you need to as you think about M&A activity in 2021 and the year that it has been. Thank you so much for joining us. It really has been an absolute uh, pleasure. I'm just making sure that we have as many people vote as we need to. I think we are good. I'm going to end that poll, share those results out. Um, and uh, as a reminder, we're going to take a very quick break. I know I fed into three minutes of the 10 minutes. So you got seven minutes up on the calendar and clock right now. Uh, but again, thanks for our experts for joining us. Enjoy your break. We will see you back here in just a handful of minutes for our next remarkable panel. Thank you so much. And we will all see you soon. Take care. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Bye-bye.